So good morning. On behalf of Texans for the Arts Foundation, it's wonderful to welcome everyone to the kickoff of our Arts Advocacy Summit 2021. I'm Cookie Ruiz, and I am Executive Director of Valley Austin, but in this role, I'm President of Texans for the Arts, the Board of Texans for the Arts Foundation and Texans for the Arts. So we are now in the second week uh, of uh, the 87th legislative session and just really happy to have this time with you today. For over 25 years, Texans for the Arts have been hard at work as our state's premier arts advocacy organization, working from the top of the panhandle all the way south to the valley, from the one tip over at Marshall and all the way to El Paso and everywhere in between. On behalf of arts organizations and artists, working to protect and increase public funding and to promote public policies that are supportive of the arts. I wanna recognize and thank each of our Texans for the Arts members that are with us here today. And as we connect virtually all across our state. And for those of you who are not yet members, we hope that you will consider joining us. As a group, uh, you all are Pretty amazing. Um, together, we represent 41% of the 150 House offices. And uh, even more surprisingly, 90% of the 31 Senate offices are represented on the call today. And we have new registrants coming in all the time between now and those important visits in two weeks. So we're very excited about that. Um, I've got my sticky notes with me because I, I took a look last night trying to think about uh, all the things, all the ways that we represent uh, this incredible support for the arts. So you all are together, um, artists and dance movement therapists and grants coordinators and program coordinators and marketers, graduate students and volunteers, retirees, um, an editor of an arts pub, um, interns, board members, professors, consultants, music therapists, art historians, art writer, um, development directors, executive directors, artistic directors, and uh, and a few a few in attorneys, and uh, so we're, we are representative of many many different types of uh, careers coming together to be supportive of the arts. You also come from forty one different city, towns, and municipalities: small, mid size, and large, rural to urban, um, where you are already advocating every day through the work that you're doing in your home area. Over the years, it's become clear that whenever and wherever Texans for the Arts travel, uh, whenever we gather together, questions continually arise on a number of issues. Um, one of them is one of our state's most important sources of public funding for the arts, the hotel occupancy tax. How best to support, defend, and when possible, to expand the extraordinary mission and the work of Texas Commission on the Arts. Uh, the differences between advocacy and lobbying, particularly as it relates to nonprofit organizations. How to effectively advocate in our members' hometown. And finally, how best to work collaboratively across the state. We hope that the time that we'll spend together over the next couple of weeks will allow each of us to perhaps dust off some skills that you have uh, but maybe haven't used in a while. Uh, maybe to learn some new advocacy skills and approaches, uh, to connect with colleagues across the state. And this one's so important that these relationships might be continuing connections for you. And to put all of this into practice through our upcoming meetings with elected officials. So today we start the process of setting the stage by sharing best practices on how to set up an effective legislative meeting and what to accomplish while there. This will be followed by some thoughts on why advocate and the elements of a successful visit, and then a panel discussion with an extraordinary group of colleagues that will be sharing how best to utilize some media to tell our powerful stories. Step two in our summit takes place two weeks from today as we conduct virtual training in the morning that will uh, include a session that we've been doing for a number of years called Speak Up, Speak Out. And it will be followed in the afternoon with that afternoon that will be filled with productive meetings. I'm an optimist, productive meetings with our elected officials. And finally, on Thursday the 11th, we're gonna come back together to do what we really enjoy doing, which is having a happy hour, this time virtual. So bring your own libation. From four to five in the afternoon, we will be celebrating the knowledge that we've gained 
and we'll be defining next steps as at that point, we will be a full four weeks into the 87th legislative session, so much to do. Our Texans for the Arts board members have been hard at work preparing for this time with you under the leadership of our Arts Advocacy Summit Chair for 2021, Fiona Bond from Waco. Fiona, give us a wave there. Thank you, Fiona, for your tremendous work um, throughout this process. So without further ado, let's get started. It's my great honor to introduce to you the author, editor, and shepherd of the recently launched Texans for the Arts uh, Hot Toolkit, a web-based toolkit that can be found on our website. A person who is one of our state's most dedicated and successful arts advocates and leaders. The executive director of Texans for the Arts, my colleague and my dear friend, Anne Graham. Thank you so much. Uh, Cookie cannot thank you enough. And I, I love one of the things we all are noticing on Zoom meetings is that lots of time people are applauding. And I don't know that we ever applauded when we had meetings in person, but I think it's a wonderful uh, tradition that legacy that we can take into the future is, is applause. Um, again, thank you all, Cookie, thank you for that introduction. Thank you all for uh, attending and joining us today. And I'm just so impressed with the numbers that Cookie shared, the diversity we have from around the state, something that has been made possible by the need to do a virtual event. Um, 2020 is in the rearview mirror. 2021 has glimmers of light and hope along the way, but we're a far cry from being able to assemble in person. Uh, the state capitol is still not available or open. We were not able to convene in person. We're not able to have our music in the rotunda, but we are able to take the strength and the power and what we learned from our former advocacy days and put it to work in a virtual setting. And the silver lining is the fact that we are able to bring so many people together and that travel is not a barrier to participation. If there's one thing that we might take into the future for future events is allowing and maintaining a virtual component to what we hope to do in person again, because that enables people to travel, virtually travel and join us in person. I just wanna throw out a few more accolades, appreciating Cookie for her leadership of our board of directors. Thank you to our 36 statewide board members, to, uh, to Fiona for masterminding and chairing this um, summit. Um, the whole summit in general, and then Chris Kiley, our associate director, Katie Poe, our membership and finance manager, Shannon Gangerty, who you will meet today, our lobbyist and government a budget relations specialist, and all of our, we have four interns who've been magnanimous in their work on this um, and have been an incredible part, Kelsey Avery, Emma Rose Goodovich, Vivian Gonzalez, and Rachel Phillips, who've been really important and um, helping mastermind all of these databases, et cetera, that you are now all a part of. And I'd like to thank the Texas Commission on the Arts for their support of this event. They play an integral role and also the Texas Cultural Trust for the development and their sharing of the state of the arts, the economic impact, education impact, and this year they are including health impact. Um, really important document that we work together with to ensure is a common talking point when we meet with our legislators. Couple key housekeeping things. Um, you can use the speaker view today if you so choose in your Zoom. Um, please use the hashtags, which should be in the, cat, the chat box, I hope soon, um, and help get the word out. Uh, we will be accepting registrants all the way up until February 9th. So please use the hashtags, tag your friends, um, and help us promote this event. The more people that are involved, uh, the better. Um, today's program is being recorded so that anybody who is unable to attend today will be able to hear it. And um, again, we'll just make that available to, to everyone. And then our, one of our interns, Kelsey Avery, has made a podcast we will be sharing on how to set up a legislative visit, which is very informative and part of our supporting materials. Um, and if you still have issues after you hear everything we're going to be doing today, um, Chris and I are holding Zoom offices, office hours on one to three this Thursday um, to help navigate and mastermind any of the uh, complexities of setting up a legislative visit. Um, so this year, as I'd mentioned, the pandemic is closed, um, it has closed the Capitol. So what we were, what we are going to see today, um, today we have the introductory session and on between today and February 9th, you will have the two week period with which to set up the, the captains will be setting up meetings. 
Um, on Tuesday, February 9th, that's our big primary training day as Cookie had referenced. For those of you who have participated in Arts Advocacy before, Arts Advocacy Day before, that will look a little familiar. You'll, we'll be having speakers around the hotel tax. Scott Jossoff with the Texas Hotel and Lodging Association. Dr. Gary Gibbs will join us from, from the Texas Commission on the Arts. And we will have artists with, um, with um, keynote speeches about the impact of the arts on their lives and the impacts on the, on the state of Texas economy. It will be a day that is um, packed with information that you will be using on your legislative visits. Um, our goals for the Advocacy Summit are really twofold. One are to break down the barriers, psychologically, psychological or rear, real, to spark your participation in the Texas legislative and democratic process and take advantage of this experience to begin to cultivate a longstanding relationship with your decision makers that is based on trust. You wanna be welcome in a legislative office. You wanna to listen to your legislators' concerns and you just don't wanna to go to your legislators when you're unhappy about something, but when you actually have something that you can listen to what their needs are and when you have something that you can offer them. This is one of the most important out outcomes and as you'll, we will have more training again on the 9th, this is where you have the opportunity to get to know them better, get to know their staff, research their backgrounds, find out what their connection, if any, is to the arts. And they will typically sort of say, I don't, I'm not an artist, I can't draw, I can't sing. And then you'll discover that in fact, they were in the marching band for years or they took ballet for their childhood. There's lots of ways that people don't think that the work that they're doing is related to the arts or they have a family member that's associated. So getting to know who your legislator is, what makes them tick, what inspires them, what tangents they have with the arts, um, signing up for their newsletters, following them on social media, and inviting them to follow you on social media and to take advantage of um, the information that, that you're sharing is, is a really important first way. First, and many of you may have already done some of this, so that will even be more helpful when you meet with your legislators um, this year. The second primary reason for Advocacy Day and this ongoing relationship with our, with our legislators is to have a seat at the table. It's for arts, culture, and creativity to, to be at the front and center of mind of our Texas legislators, um, reminding them that appropriating public resources for the arts is an investment in the healthy future of the state of Texas for residents, for the communities and to help attract and draw tourism, which is a mainstay of our economy with the hotel, Texas hotel, um, the municipal hotel occupancy tax. Um, meeting with our legislators is a critical point, being face-to-face, -face, even virtually with them and imparting information about why arts, culture, and creativity is so important for both an economic reason and a social reason and a societal and a personal reason is one of the key things that we want to accomplish at this, um, on this occasion. We in the Zoom room already know about the power of the arts to heal, to strengthen, to bridge, to restore, to grow, and to empower. We also know and have been witnessing through the pandemic that the arts and art making doesn't stop, not even in the pandemic. From the first Italians singing from their balconies to classical music events being performed in drive-in movie theaters, from dance performances set in outdoor sculpture gardens to a young poet laureate, Amanda Gordon, reciting the hill we climb at the president inauguration, President Biden's inauguration, the arts don't stop, but they and their creators struggle to move forward in this pandemic. More often than not, in times of hardship, and unfortunately, even in times of plenty, investing public resources in the arts is often looked at as an afterthought, an extra, and not only do we not have time now, during the pandemic to be as an afterthought, but the evidence is in our favor that we are far from it and that the impact of the arts is not only economic, but societal. With data from the 200, 2017 Federal Bureau of Economic Analysis states that the Texas creative economy generated over $46.6 billion and that there are over 375,000 creative workers in Texas and over 53,000 creative businesses. At the same time, given that abundance recorded in 2017, due to the pandemic, artists and arts organizations leaders are struggling with enormous consequences for their livelihoods. The Brookings Institute research from last summer measured that um, the $7.3 billion in lost revenue for the creative economy. 
Unemployment in the sector is over 190,000. Over 65% of the arts organizations have been severely impacted and the average lost wages per creative worker in 2020 was over $14,000. 57% of creatives in Texas have no savings. And the performing arts continues to be stymied with the real mantra that we repeat over and over, which is the performing arts were the first for, to first to close and the last to reopen. And we're seeing that on the horizon as well. While vaccines are on their way, and that will help tremendously in the coming months as we tread water until we're able to be together, I'd like to suggest that we reframe our discussion around the arts and that we don't think of ourselves so much as in the creative economy, as the silo in the creative economy, but that we knowingly assert ourselves into the overall state economy. That we're not looked at as one silo, arts and culture, but that we break down the walls of the silo and, and show how we're all a part of all of the economic sectors. Um, a small case in point to illustrate this example, $31.47 is a magical number of the average amount each attendee going to a performing arts event um, spends beyond the ticket cost on meals, retail, parking, lodging, local transportation, childcare, and souvenirs. Multiply that and that's over $100 billion in ancillary spending in American communities directly because of cultural events. And that's not even counting the arts part of the equation, what the, what the arts engendered and the economy there. I think it's really important for us to, when we meet with our legislators, is to start representing the arts economy more and more as absolutely integral to the American economy, to the Texas economy. So we're not just a big number and a big player, but we're integral and woven into other sectors of the economy. In some ways, we're no different than other employment sectors, right? Arts workers are real workers, vital economic and social contributors to our communities. Real people with real jobs where your neighbors supporting themselves and their families providing essential services to the community. At the same time, we're completely different with many of the needs that we have for production and creation and creativity. Um, and one of my friends, Julie Baker, Executive Director of T T Californians for the Arts, has coined the phrase second responders. We're not running into the burning buildings, quote, to save lives, but we're there outside the building helping to rebuild lives. We're bringing the healing powers of the arts to bear. That's what the arts do. The arts are integral. For our Arts Advocacy Summit, we want to be ready with facts and figures and data but we also wanna be ready with stories about how your own livelihood in the arts, stories about how the arts continue to impact you and your community, stories about why the arts are critical to your community out of the pandemic and into the future. On February 9th, as Cookie alluded to, we're gonna have three hour packed hours of advocacy training, lessons on how to run an effective legislative meeting. The content, what is our legislative agenda? What is the legislative asks? Speaking to the cultural districts for the Texas Commission on the Arts, speaking to the hotel tax, speaking to state tourism resources, speaking to CARES Act and um, support and more. And then talking points around data and the stories that you have to support our case. You'll hear from guest speakers um, informing about the nuts and bolts and the data. You'll be hearing about stories and you'll be learning about sort of the political landscape of the 87th session, the finance and appropriation process, tax policy and more. As I also said, you'll get an insight of this next week. We'll be forwarding some other preliminary information for you to draw from. Um, and then you'll be meeting with your legislators in the afternoon. So how do we get from sitting here today to, to um, Tuesday, the 9th of February? Tomorrow, Wednesday, each of you will receive an email. And in that email will be the name of everybody who's registered in the district, your House and Senate district, um, along with who has self-identified as a captain. If someone hasn't self-identified as a captain, we're looking to you for leadership and support in that arena. Um, and instructions on who to call and who to reach out to to set up your legislative visits. Again, each one of you will have a Senate and a House. Some of you have signed up with more than one Senate and House because you work and live in a different district and you'll, be ha you'll have to make a choice just based on how many office visits you can make. Every district needs a captain or a co-captain. So please don't be shy about volunteering to be a captain if you've not done so. 
Most of the um, visits already have captains, but if you don't, we hope you step up for that. The week before the ninth, we'll be sending out the preliminary information. And then between now and the ninth, the captains will be setting up these legislative visits. If you have any questions in the process, um, you can, we will be holding a Zoom chat. Chris Riley and I will be holding it. Chris Kiley and I will be hosting a Zoom meeting this Thursday from one to three. Um, and you can also email us at info at texansforthearts.com if you have, and this will be in your news as well. Um, but what's really important is for you to be able to set up that meeting. Um, and the instructions will be on the form as to whether or not that meeting is something you have to write a letter or call in. Um, on the afternoon of the February 9th, after all of the training, you will be conducting those meetings and those meetings will most likely be in Zoom. And sometimes the captains will be hosting those and sometimes legislators will be hosting those. And that information is also on the spreadsheet that you'll be receiving on Wednesday. Um, that is a, a bit of a whirlwind on what's happening between now and the 9th. And then again, as Cookie alluded to on the 11th reconvening um, for the happy hour to celebrate and to sort of analyze as well what we all accomplished and what follow up there is because following up on the session is critically important in terms of helping answer any questions that your legislator or staff um, didn't have answered and or helping build and strengthen your ongoing relationship with your decision maker. Now I would like to introduce our next speaker, Shannon Gangurdi, who is our government relations and budget analyst and our lobbyist. Shannon is going to be speaking about why advocate and what makes for a successful legislative visit. And um, she has an amaz amazing credentials and we are so proud that she's part of our team. She has an undergraduate degree from UT Austin. She has a law degree from Washington College of Law at the American University in DC. She is a born and raised in Texas. And she came back to Austin after a law degree to pursue, be in private practice, but she decided she wanted to work in the Texas legislature. And for 17 years, she did, did just that, honing her skills um, as general counsel to Senator Jane Nelson, as committee chair, um, administrative committee chair for the Health and Human Services Committee, and then the Senate Finance Committee. And she is an expert on the field and we have benefited greatly from her. Her last day of work in the legislature was October 31st, 2018. And she was hired by us on, on November 1st, 2018, within hours of her departure from the legislature. And she's been a key part of the grass tops and built bridging the grass roots with us. So I would now like to turn this over to Shannon. Thank you very much, Shannon. Thank you so much, Anne. And actually it was 2017. Oh my so gosh. Yeah, so <laughs> it feels like yesterday, um, but it's gone by very quickly. So um, oh, I was very excited for uh, my first day to be with Texans for the Arts, for sure. And I was actually thinking about two years ago, um, Texans for the Arts Advocacy Day, it was my first advocacy day to be on the other side. And I was so blown away by the number of participants, the organization, I had no idea how much went into an advocacy day um, and the work and the planning um, and was blown away by the whole thing and was disappointed, um, you know, like everything else right now that we can't be together. But I'm hopeful that with every other silver lining that we're finding in COVID, that this format is going to allow more people to engage in advocacy. And I think once you start, you don't stop. Once you understand that you have a voice and that your voice can be heard, um, you wanna keep doing it. So hopefully the silver lining will be that when we're finally back together, um, we'll have even more numbers. We'll have to find a bigger space if possible. So, um, and you asked me to talk about, you know, why advocacy matters. And I think it's really important to understand that there are 31 state senators, there's 150 House members. And so, for example, each senator represents about a million constituents. They are on multiple committees. They are asked to vote on legislation that covers education, healthcare, infrastructure, water, transportation. Um, so they're really asked to be experts in, in every issue that faces a Texan, um, but they're not. They're not experts in, they may be experts in one field, but they're not gonna be experts across the board. And a lot of times they're experts in the legislative process. They understand how to get a bill passed, but they may not understand the nuances of being a teacher in you know, 
a junior high right now? Like, what does that look like? So they don't, they need advocates. They need experts in the field coming to them and giving them information so that they can make the best decisions for their constituents. And so, you know, in, in comes in the advocacy and you could by yourself as a constituent walk into a senator's office today and well, not today, you could virtually walk into an office and you could provide your input. However, with a million constituents, that's not really a productive uh, way to understand what's happening in the field. And so senators, House members, their staff, they really like working with organizations, associations that can speak on behalf of a field, an expertise, a stakeholder community. And so um, that's what we're doing. I mean, we're using our voices to go in and have meetings and representing constituents on an issue that we have expertise. I don't personally have the expertise. You all have the expertise. Um, so you will walk in with something that they need. They need your expertise. They need your information so that they can represent their constituency. And so what I'm going to talk about next is that actual visit. And Anne told me that I had 10 tips at the last legislative um, advocacy day. And it's really funny. I was writing up my notes last night and I, I just, you know, were ticking them off my brain as a former staffer. And lo and behold, when I finished, there were 10. So I'm going to stick with 10 today. Um, maybe these are the same. I, I don't know if you were there last last time. Um, it might be very similar, but I think it's a good refresher if you if you were. So the first one is, uh, I think Anne started touching on this, but the first one is staff matters. And that might sound biased. As Anne told you, I was 17 years a staffer in the Senate finance, um, I'm sorry, in the Texas Senate in a variety of capacities. And my job was to meet with constituents, meet with organizations, listen, ask questions, and take that information and put it in a form that my boss could use at the right time. And so it may not be that um, you know my former boss needed 100 pieces of information every day as they were coming in, but as she was about to decide on the budget or as she was going to decide on a particular piece of legislation, I made sure that she had all the information she needed. As opposed to, it's great to meet with the actual member, but unfortunately, a lot of times when you meet with the member, they're listening to a whole bunch of people at the same time, they have their meeting, um, and they may not, believe it or not, write it down or tell anybody. <laughs> um, staff person writes it down, they put it into the system, and they make sure that it's there when, when needed. So um, don't discredit if you are asked to meet with staff as opposed to the actual member, uh, you know, still give it your college try because that information is going to be um, instrumental for the member. The second one is constituents matter. And so when you're walking into an office, if you are a constituent, make sure you tell the staff person or the member that you are a constituent. Or if you represent an organization that is located within their district, or if you serve folks in their district, just try to tie it back to their constituents because that will be an automatic kind of ding um, for the staffer or for the member that they need to pay a little bit extra attention. And um, when we get done, I can try to put into the chat room, there is a website that's called Who Represents Me that you can plug in your address, your office address, and it will let you know the Senator and the House member that does represent you. The third one is, um, and Ann touched on this, is know your audience and speak to that audience. And so I'm gonna give you an, give you an example of last session. We worked with, with Republican leadership. Uh, we worked with Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, Senator Jane Nelson, who's the chair of Senate Finance. And we provided information, we told a story, we gave data, and we were told by both of those offices that what resonated with them was the economic impact. We told them when you have an art event and it supported the restaurants, hotels, the dollar amounts that are being spent in and around that event are, are helping our economy. That resonated with them. So we are going to, on steroids, talk to them about economic impact. Um, other members may have a very close um, connection with the arts personally. We had another member who, um, and Anne, I won't remember the exact connection, but they had a child 
uh, a son or a daughter that was um, very connected with the arts industry. We used that connection and really spoke their language. And so knowing who you're, you're talking to and then using data that will resonate with that member. The next one, which I just talked about, but it's tell a story. Uh, Senator Whitmire, he is from the Houston area and he is on Senate Finance and he is notorious for saying, put a face on it. So we talk all the time about statistics and data and we tell a story, um, but who are we talking about? Who's impacted by this? Who are the people? So put a face on what it is you're advocating for. And I'll give you an example, Ann and I and, and other folks with TFA have been working all interim to talk to the budget writers about COVID and the impact that COVID has had on the arts, the devastation and job loss, the um, disproportional impact by the fact that the arts were some of the first folks to close down. We, we believe they'll be some of the last folks to fully be operational by virtue of how they are set up. And so we're trying to tell that story in a narrative form that puts some familiarity around what we're talking about. Um, the next one is having to ask. So I can't tell you how many times as a staffer, somebody would come in or a group would come in and they would talk and they would tell me their story and they would talk about why it was important to support the arts or it was important to support X, Y, or Z. And then we would get done and I had no idea what they wanted me to do with this information. That's great that we support that, but what tangible thing do you want me as a member or as a staff person to do. Uh, we have a variety of tools in our toolkits, but that's it. I mean, we can pass a bill, we can appropriate money, um, we can try to uh, prevent a bill from passing. So what is it that we want them to do? And I know that in our next communication, um, we will be providing documentation. We will talk about the uh, Texas for the Arts agenda. So we will give you that information, but just know that when you get to the end of the conversation, you want an ask to walk away with. That leads to the next one, which is a, a one pager. That's a, I probably, for every time I said the word one pager when I worked inside the building, I wish if I had a dollar, I would hopefully uh, would go retire somewhere. But um, have a, a, a document or something that the staff person or the member can refer back to. So again, they're gonna be meeting with group after group after group. And then when they go back to sit down and think about it, if they can have a document that clearly and concisely puts together the narrative, the ask, um, all of our information, then that's gonna be helpful for them. And that's gonna make sure that we've advocated um, to the best of our ability. Um, the next one is follow up. And Ann talked about this as well. Um, and I'm gonna combine this. Get contact information when you're in the meeting, uh, an email address, some way to communicate back with whoever you met with, and then follow up. Tell them thank you for their time. Provide the document perhaps again, maybe reference, um, you may have talked about a story and there's a news article, some way to just kind of reconnect the dots from your visit. And now you're starting to form a relationship with that person that potentially in a month or so you could email back again, wanted to check back in, can I offer any more additional information? So you're starting to create that relationship. Um, let's see here. Um, the next one is be respectful of their time. Um, I know I keep saying the same thing over and over again. They're in meetings constantly all day long. And so you want to tell your story, get your message across, make your ask, get contact information, and then let the conversation end um, at the organic right spot. Just because you have 30 minutes set and you're finished around the 20 minute mark, that's okay. They're not going to hold it against you if you end the meeting a little bit early. Or if you have a 30 minute meeting, don't go over, respect their time and make sure that you don't leave them in a bad spot. Leave them feeling really good and positive about your visit and not um, you know, rush to the next thing. And, um, the last one on my list, and this is a little bit outside of the, actually there's two more on my list. So let me go, this is number nine, I forgot my count. Um, number nine, and again, Anne mentioned this, when they actually do what you ask them to do, 
go back and tell them, thank you. Probably at the end of session, I got maybe one or two groups come back and tell me, thank you for X. We asked you to do something and then you did it. Thank you for that. About a hundred times I would hear back when we didn't do something that people liked. And I remembered the folks that would come back when I actually did do the thing, um, not myself, but our office would do the thing that was being asked of us. And so don't underestimate the power of, of just positive reinforcement. Um, and the last thing, it's not necessarily within this visit, but I think it will stem from these visits and hopefully uh, continue on throughout the interim. And that is look for opportunities outside of session to develop relationships with staff, with the member. We are so uniquely positioned um, as art organizations. We have really cool things to invite members to attend. You have art galleries, you have, you know, we took a, a a group of staff to museums in the Fort Worth area, and they talked about it for months afterwards. You have musical events, invite members to attend, invite their staff to attend, create that relationship so that when it comes to session and you're asking for a meeting next time around, you have a connection with the folks that you're talking to. There's also members that will have town hall meetings or they will reach out to their constituents, attend go to their town halls, speak up. And lastly, as Ann mentioned, social media, it's unbelievable how much members pay attention to their own social media accounts and read the comments and respond and retweet. And so if you want an audience and you thank them for something on social media, that's just another connection that you've made. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn it back to Ann and make sure I didn't miss anything um, or make sure I've covered what I need to cover. No, thank you so much, Shannon. That was great. And I think that's the next podcast right there is to <laughs> repeat performance because every single one of the 10, uh, 10 top tips that you shared, we all have a story. In fact, I bet you on this call, many of you have a story that you can relate directly back to you know, one of those recommendations. And I'll just reiterate the one about thanking people. Um, we were, Shannon and I were in the bowels of the Capitol meeting with a staffer and in a very bleak office with no windows at the one of the staffer's desk, there I noticed on the side, taped up on this woman's desk was a thank you card that I had written to her. It was a handwritten note. And it was the only article of color of humanity kind of in this sterile office building. So um, I just, that was just a little visual snippet, like, whoa, thanking people matters. Thanking in our world matters. So um, that was really, really huge. Um, Thank you. And I'm going to now hop over to the, the final part of today's session, which I'm really excited about. Uh, we have never done this. This is, this is our inaugural effort and we have a great team. Um, Fiona Bond will be introducing uh, Dr. Tyra Lindsay Warren um, from Baylor University and Chris Heinbaugh from the AT&T Performing Arts Center in Dallas and a member of our board um, to tackle for the first time here, not just how we communicate within our legislative process with our legislators, but how do we take this next step outreach into the media and expand the capacity of our getting our story out and getting the word out. So I'm going to turn this over to Fiona. Um, again, as a, as a board member, um, Fiona, just let me sing her credentials a little bit too. Um, she came from the uh, UK and she has a rich experience um, of pro uh, professional development and arts sector work in England and in Scotland. She has a bachelor's degree in theology and an MBA she has from Baylor. Um, and she is the founder and executive director of Creative Waco, which has really put uh, the Waco Texans for the Arts, Texans, excuse me, Texas Commission on the Arts Cultural District on the map and the community on the map for creative, um, transformative change in the city of Waco around the arts. So uh, without further ado, let me pass this along to Fiona to moderate our special panel. Fiona. Thank you so much, Anne, and uh, thank you to everybody. Thanks, Shannon and Cookie. 
We so appreciate the work that you do. I love that you both literally and metaphorically bring color to politics and uh, you know, the splash of interest. I know that um, last time we did this in person, um, I was in an elevator with some staffers of, um, of, of one of the um, senators and they were asking us, you know, what group we represented. And we said, oh, you know, we represent the arts. And they said, oh, we love it when you guys come around and you're much less scary than the gun people, which I just thought was a terrific, uh, you know, I'm so sorry that we can't do this in person this year, but how fabulous that we can meet at least virtually. And thank you so much to everybody who is on this call. It matters that you are here. It matters that you do this work. And so I'm really, um, I'm really thrilled to be um, moderating this panel with um, two people who I think are superbly qualified to help us think about how what we are trying to do in terms of advocacy is absolutely seamless across both politics and the media as well. It really matters how we tell our story and we have some of the best content for storytelling that there is in this field. So I just want to talk a little bit about sort of how this panel works and then introduce our panelists. We, um, the goal of this panel is to give very practical guidance, encouragement, inspiration to you as arts leaders across Texas on how to use traditional and new media to tell why the arts are so important in our communities and why the public investment in the arts matters. We all know that it does and being able to express that and tell that both you know, through the media and also to our elected representatives is hugely important. So we have two phenomenal panelists. I'm going to introduce Dr. Tyra Lindsay Warren first and then Chris Heinbaugh, um, but I'm gonna ask Chris to then speak um, a little bit about, you know, just from his perspective, then Dr. Tyra to speak from her perspective. And then I'd like to invite you out there in the ether across the state to ask uh, questions um, using the chat. And um, I think, you know, this is, hopefully this will be a really great interactive session, even though we can't physically be in the same space. This, uh, the toolkit that we get through Zoom allows us to do this really effectively. So please participate, ask your questions and, um, and let's get a good discussion going. So Dr. Tyra Lindsay Warren is a marketing scholar, business exec executive, artist and entrepreneur. And in her role as professor of marketing at Baylor University, Dr. Lindsay Warren studies consumer behavior and attitudes, multicultural media and advertising, movies and entertainment, and is a nationally recognized consumer behavior scholar and effective strategic communications expert. She holds an MBA from Claremont and PhD from Rutgers. And her career is rooted in film and media and in the arts. Um, she served public relations leadership roles in the film industry and for Alvin Ailey American Dance Theatre. The strand that runs through both her marketing praxis and her academic research is the power of storytelling in marketing and communication. She's presented her work across academic and practitioner, practitioner domains, including the AFTA Americans for the Arts Convention, She's also one of the best jazz singers I know. She's a wonderful performer and musician. And just in case you're wondering what she does in her spare time, she also heads up the Waco International Family and Faith Film Festival, which is coming up in early February. Uh, please Google it after this session and sign up. It will be um, virtual this year. Um, lots of sessions that you can jump in on if you're a fan of film. Chris Heinbar is our second panelist. He's the Vice President of Ex External Affairs for the AT&T Performing Arts Center in, the, in Dallas and a longtime board member of Texans for the Arts. He brings a range of public relations and political experience to our advocacy table. Prior to his work in the arts, Chris had an 18 year career as an Emmy Award win winning television journalist at stations across the country, including seven years covering politics and City Hall at the ABC affiliate in Dallas. He also served four years as chief of staff to the mayor of Dallas. So Chris comes to us today kind of as having served as both poacher and gamekeeper in this space um, on both sides of you know, being a journalist and also delivering information to journalists. 
Since moving to the center 10 years ago, Chris has worked in collaboration with his Dallas colleagues to build an effective arts advocacy and campaigning capability. Arts Vote Dallas has a strong focus on building city support and hotel occupancy tax funding for diverse and growing Dallas arts community. He has also worked closely with his TFA colleagues on protecting and growing the funding for the Texas Commission on the Arts and ensuring that Texas remains a welcoming and inclusive state for all artists, arts organizations, arts tourism, and patrons of the arts. So welcome to both our panelists, Chris, I'm gonna let you go first and uh, we look forward to hearing from you, thank you. Well, thank you, Fiona, for the uh, nice introduction. Tyra, it's good to be on this panel with you and Ann and Cookie and Shannon and everyone. Um, we appreciate all that you all do for the arts in Texas. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about both advocacy strategy <clears throat> and media strategy because ultimately they need to dovetail for the most impact. Um, advocacy uh, is really all about building relationships, right? And we do that all the time with our audiences, with our patrons. We try to build relationships. It's the same thing with advocacy and the same thing with the press. Your success depends on how well you build and how well you sustain those relationships and the kind of relationship that it is. You know, most of the time when we're advocating or lobby, you're lobbying, we show up during the session maybe once um, to say hello, and then just before an important vote or crisis, you know, there's a flurry of activity, and then we don't see people again, you know, see them again for the next year or two. Well, what kind of message does that send an elected official and government officials? We say that the relationship is transactional and it's not authentic. We just show up when we need something. And of course, then the elected official doesn't really have a lot invested in the relationship or your organization or your cause. And uh, she doesn't have much skin in the game and she's not gonna look out for you. And that is not effective advocacy. And the same applies to the media as well. I'm, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we kind of approach it in Dallas in terms of the elections. Um, our advocacy starts actually months before an election. Um, we uh, spend time with pretty much with city elections. We spend time meeting with every candidate for city council or mayor, including those up for re-election, all of them, because ultimately we want all of them to be advocates for the arts. We don't want somebody running against the arts and somebody running for it. We want them all supporting the arts. And we walk them through the importance and impact of the arts on the economy, tourism, property values, corporate relocations and talent, jobs, education, uh, quality of life and more. And we do our homework. Have they come to our shows before? Which arts groups and programs are located in their districts? Which schools in their districts do our arts education programs serve? And then when we meet with them, we take a picture and we post it. And we have these arts boat buttons, okay? And they wear them and they wanna be there with us and we post them all over. So it's great. And this is really important again, to hit all of the candidates. Um, and we also do arts questionnaires. You know, We don't endorse, we post the answers. We hold candidate meet and greets before the election with the arts groups and the candidates. Um, we even hosted an arts mayoral debate one year and uh, it was early in the race. The audience was packed and our arts issues got very good coverage uh, before you know, the race got clouded with a lot of other things. We attend debates, we ask our questions. And of course, once they're elected, it doesn't stop there. We show up at town hall meetings. We make sure uh, people are asking arts related questions. The point being, we're very strategic about building these relationships and sustaining them. Again, the media, it's the same thing. We need to have a parallel strategy in the media in terms of making our case to the public, but also in turn, taking those stories and things and making sure the elected officials see them as well. And this is a challenge today, right? Less and less press coverage in the arts. You know, most, uh, we've got a few at the Dallas Morning News that are still there, but the, the broad swath, they're gone. Okay, we have a few assigned to cover the arts, but most papers today, and most certainly not TV stations or anything else, they don't have people covering the arts. Okay, so you're going to have to do a lot of handholding and developing those relationships with reporters, just as you do with the elected officials. You need to get to know them. And again, they may not be arts reporters. 
They may be city hall reporters. They may be political reporters who are covering the legislature. You need to take the time to walk them through the importance of the arts. Same thing as we did with the, le with the elected officials, the economy, tourism, property values, all those pieces, those are very important. And the time to do that usually is before <laughs> you need the story, okay? Dropping at the last minute, it's just, it's fire hose, okay? So you wanna cultivate these relationships, not on deadline. Uh, one thing that's important, again, understanding now, just like us, there are fewer people doing more things. Same thing with the reporters. You need to make their life easy. You need to have your information ready to go. You need to kind of know what the headline is. You know, Shannon was talking about knowing your key points. Know what your headline is. Know what it is that you want to get out there. Have that information really ready to go. You need to get back to them quickly. If they're on deadline and a call and a call back tomorrow, that doesn't do you any good. Okay. You need to respond within an hour. And then if you've got something unique and you want to get good placement, make sure they have an exclusive. Negotiate with them to get that. And you know, remember, they are eager to get front page stories. They are eager to get stories that click, that have a lot of clicks. And that tells also the news operation, gee, people are interested in the arts. People are interested in this story. They look at all those things. All right, press releases. When you write a press release, write it just as the story, write it as the story you would like to see in the paper, okay? It is really important that your ideas are clear and that it sends the message. And because many, many media sites today, they're gonna turn around and just run your release as it is, okay? This is the one piece you actually have complete control over. So there is no excuse for not putting your best foot forward, all right? Um, but one of the things that we have learned and I think have done a good job with in Dallas is um, we wanna be proactive, not just reactive. Um, and so one of the things we do is our arts leaders work very closely together on stories about our community. And during COVID, this has been absolutely critical in driving stories. And I can't stress this enough, this communication between arts organizations, because it helps align our messaging, which in turn supports our advocacy efforts. Okay, so we realized we had to become content developers and we needed to drive the stories. And, um, and I'll give you an example because one of the big challenges during COVID has been quantifying the impact on the arts community and convincing the public and our donors and our elected officials that the arts are worth supporting. So I had been sitting in on some city hall, city uh, town hall meetings talking about support for small businesses. And I realized nobody at city hall was tracking the impact on the arts at all. And city staff kind of viewed us as this luxury that um, you know could come or go, but we needed to send a very strong message that nonprofit arts organizations are small businesses, jobs are at stake. If we fail, the ripple effect will hit so many parts of our economy and we need support like every other business needs support. So we began a project and we started surveying all the arts organizations in the city of Dallas, okay? and started finding out what was the economic impact? What was your budget before? What, what have you lost in terms of audience, attendance, um, financial impact, jobs? And the numbers were absolutely staggering. $33 million through May 31st. So we created press releases. We gave the exclusive to a morning news reporter, got front page coverage. Um, we made, the edit made sure the editorial board had the numbers and those were woven in occasionally with um, opinion pieces. We made sure our elected officials and government leaders had this. And um, then we did another one a few months later, and that was up to 67 million in losses and 1,200 jobs. And again, this is just in Dallas alone. And we are just about to release another survey that went through November, 30, November 30th, and we're up to $95 million in losses, okay? Those kind of things resonate with our elected officials. They get that. They all of a sudden understood, oh my gosh, these are businesses. These are things that are impacting our economy and our community. We have to continue supporting our arts. And um, other things that we could do along those lines, generate letters to the editors, right? Keep them about 250 to 300 words. Opinion pieces. Get somebody to write an opinion piece. All of these things help drive the conversation 
and has been absolutely uh, critical in protecting our funding at City Hall. Okay, and by the way, a little side note, if you wanna do this story, I mean, you may be thinking, gosh, I wish we'd done that. Well, the one year anniversary kind of of the shutdown is coming up. That is a perfect peg. And if you start doing a survey now and crunch those numbers, it will hit right about in February coming up on that one year anniversary, which by the way, also generates great stories right during the middle of the legislative session, okay? So those are powerful stories that your lawmakers can get their heads around and you're giving them ammunition to basically support us, why they need to support the arts, okay? Um, but we didn't just stop with those kind of things. We did things like we developed um, COVID safety guidelines with UT Southwestern and we shared those with the press. Um, when our staff were making shields and masks for clinics early in the pandemic, we got those stories up and kind of sent the message, we're pitching in with everyone else to help and serve the community. Um, and so again, education, that's another thing. How are we helping in the schools? Education really resonates with lawmakers, elected officials. How are we doing to help kids out there and the educators? So those were important stories. And again, we all know how to sell our exhibitions and our shows or any of our organizations. We have to apply those same strategies to our community and in terms of how we're selling to the press and how we're selling to the lawmakers. Okay. Um, and I'll to tell you real quick a few things on television. It's a bigger challenge. It has to appeal to a broader audience and you've got to have visuals to back up the story. So if you haven't, start gathering video, start gathering photography, make sure your media is accessible on a website and is the best quality possible. Um, uh, put your leaders out there for interviews and make sure they're prepared with talking points. Um, and then if you've got great stories, uh, that have been done, make sure you're sending the link, not just to your boards and patrons and donors, but also your elected officials. And, uh, and same principles apply to social media. Um, but the bottom line is be prepared, have your press list created and up to date, make sure it has an individual's email address, uh, you know, the individual people's, but also the news and assignment desk. We know there's a lot of turnover. So if you're sending it to one reporter and that reporter is long gone, that news organization is not getting your email. So um, make sure you've got the organization's email. Um, and then make sure this list includes elected officials, city, your county, your school board trustees, your state officials, and even your federal officials. We've known that's been very important with Save Our Stages and some of that funding. So uh, make sure your media packets are up to date. Make sure that the quality is good and it represents you well. Again, return calls and emails quickly. And uh, when you put your people out as subject matters, this is really important. Make sure that all their equipment works, their online media and Zoom equipment, that they know how to frame their shot. Nothing worse than, you know, this. And that we see a lot of that. Um, make sure they're not backlit. Make sure their audio works is up, is working and isn't dropping out and that their internet signal is uh, strong. And Shannon said, you know, put a face on it. Make sure you've got great subjects, people. So it's not just this broad arts community, have somebody ready to go, some arts organization that can tell you a story, okay? And, uh, and make sure they're armed with talking points. And then um, can you help uh, these organizations maybe get access to your venues for videos? Um, uh, bottom line is if you're able to move quickly, provide them with what, what they need, they will continue coming back to you for stories. And again, those stories drive opinion in the community and hopefully help provide, uh, as I said, ammunition for uh, lawmakers. And um, and I, real quick, I'll wrap up, but Anne gave a, the note about uh, her letter being posted up there. I'll tell you a similar story because I think it goes back to that whole thing with building relationships with your lawmakers and a lot of personal touch points. Several sessions ago, I remember walking into a lawmaker's office and it was actually someone I knew. And I noticed she, and she was pretty new. And I noticed there was nothing on her walls, nothing at all. And I just said, well, this just looks horrible. And so I said, you know, what if I got a picture of our opera house, put it in a frame that you could put on the wall? And she goes, well, and I can't remember what the dollar amount was, but it wasn't much. She goes, as long as it's under that, and because I can take it with the ethics. 
uh, with the ethnic code. So I got her a picture and there it was our opera house on her office wall. Now, if several groups did that, she would end up having three or four on there. So it's those little personal things too with the lawmakers that make a difference, those personal touch points. And uh, hopefully there are lots of arts touch points and those touch points create an arts wave. And, uh, and that's something that they're gonna remember. So I'll, I'll wrap it up here and I'll uh, toss it over to Tyra to pick it up. Thank you, Chris. Um, happy Tuesday, everyone. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Anne, for having me. It's a pleasure to be on this panel. You know, I think Chris, I think Chris, you know, captured everything <laughs> in all of his remarks. Um, I will just uh, compliment, if I may, everything that Chris shared, especially coming from my perspective as being a marketing and public relations executive over the past 20 years working not only in Hollywood, but also in New York City, not only as the public relations director for Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, but also serving on the boards for the Tony Award winning Crossroads Theater in New Brunswick, New Jersey, as well as Jazz Forum Arts in Westchester County, New York, one of the premier jazz presenters uh, in upstate New York. And so, as Fiona shared in my introduction, as a consumer behavior scholar, I did, um, develop this construct, if you will, called empowered storytelling. So essentially that is storytelling that exudes the emotion of empowerment and how does that impact not only consumer behaviors and purchase intentions, but message recall. But this type of communication strategy is truly effective as it relates to reaching media. And I came about, you know, developing that construct from my years of working uh, and uh, cultivating media relationships all across this country. Um, and so arts organizations really exude um, all the, the elements, if you will, to create empowered storytelling and use that messaging to empower the media people to be you know, extensions of your storytelling to your target audiences and, um, and really move them in a way so they will always be coming back for more to all of you. Um, another aspect you know, of my uh, working as a practitioner in this field is bringing them into the process. And when I say them, I'm purely talking about media uh, people. Bring the media folks into your process at all times. Uh, I remember when I was at ALE and every um, December, the first company does a five week uh, stay at uh, City Center in Manhattan. And during the summer as the first company was rehearsing for the, the December uh, run, you know, I remember talking to Ms. Jamison and Ms. Jamison was just like, Tyra, you gotta do something different. You gotta do something different. We have to up our media game. And so what I decided to do was bring the media into the rehearsals um, so they could see Ms. Jamison, you know, instructing the dancers, do this and do that, et cetera, et cetera. So they could see the dancers trying to learn, you know, everything that was, uh, that they needed to be outstanding come December. And I did not describe you know, in terms of media, you know, I invited not only the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the New York Sun at the time, as well as producers from um, at the time Regis and Kelly um, and Good Morning America and things of that nature, but also you can't forget your multicultural press, um, your African American, your Latino, your Asian American press, bring them all in to the process because they're not usually ever invited to, to, to see how the art is being created, you know, bring them into the process. They came during their lunch hour, had a wonderful time, you know, seeing the dance, seeing Miss Jamison and things of that nature. So when they were invited back during the, the grand run that December, they saw the finished piece and they loved it because they got to see the process. So cultivating media in a way to see the process and even now with digital, it's even better because media people can take pictures and start you know, uploading things on social to show their respective audiences on social 
the process of your theater um, art form as well. So cultivating media during the process, cultivating them when you don't need anything, you know, during the summers, uh, during that early time frame, you know, I didn't need anything from them. Um, so, and they love that. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like to be rushed, you know, so let time be your friend and cultivate them even when you don't need anything. It's so funny, um, Fiona mentioned that I'm the founder of the Waco Family and Faith International Film Festival. So on my host committee, which is a volunteer host committee, I have the mayor of the city of Waco. I have the vice mayor pro tem of the city of Waco. I have two council members on the city of Waco and they participate on this host committee for six months, ladies and gentlemen. And I don't really need anything from them. I just need them to jump on a Zoom call, hear what's going on, and then perhaps, you know, talk about it to their friends and colleagues during, um, you know, their daily lives. And believe it or not, they love that. <laughs> they love just showing up, participating on my host committee. And then when it's time for the film festival, which we launch next week, they have no problem showing up. You know, Mayor Dylan Meek of the city of Waco, he has a wonderful letter in our program. He was like, Tyra, whatever you need. And that's what you want all your folks to say, all your stakeholders from media to legislators, whatever you need, right? That's the kind of support you want to galvanize and cultivate using an empowered storytelling uh, communication strategy. And then finally, when we talk about digital, because I also teach digital marketing at Baylor University, I cannot emphasize enough the power of influencers. Uh, there is no brand out here nowadays. There's no Fortune 500 brand that is not incorporating the use of influencers and any type of strategic marketing campaign. And so inherently all arts organizations have influencers, you know, by way of your artists, right? Um, hopefully the artists that you're using and incorporating into your arts have been working, you know, to build up their followership on whatever channels they're on from Instagram to Facebook to TikTok to Twitch, whatever the case may be. But um, there's also arts influencers out there that you could start uh, researching. They may be nano influencers, micro influencers, or higher, you know, higher level with higher followers than that. But I definitely implore you to begin to actively research influencers in your respective towns and cities and start galvanizing them to be an extension of your storytelling and extension in, of your public relations efforts. Fantastic. Thank you both um, Chris and Dr. Tyra for um, that wonderful kind of 360 um, view of where you come at this from. Um, we have a few questions and I would encourage, you know, those of you out there who are on this, please uh, do use the Q&A uh, chat to ask questions that you've got. I've got a couple that I, I want to kind of kick off with and would love to um, invite you, maybe Chris, if you go first, uh, Tyra, if you then follow up or, or if you just want to jump in there, that's, that's totally fine too. Um, so the first question is, um, can you give us a quick brainstorm around perhaps less obvious media channels or tactics that you think we could or should be using in the arts? Tyra, you, you touched on one there in terms of using media influences. What's worked for you that people in this session may not have considered? Well, I definitely cannot, again, talk enough about the, the impact of influencers, especially in terms of your digital efforts. But you have to embrace everything, if you will. You know, um, you know, some folks are just like, leave the traditional media behind, just focused on digital. I just totally disagree with that. If you're trying to reach all of your stakeholders from boomers to millennials to Gen Z, you're gonna have to, uh, use and um, use effectively, I should say, all of the channels available to you, because believe it or not, they all feed off of each other. You know, you can see a billboard on I-35 on such and such, and then see it again on Facebook or uh, Instagram. And again, you know, it's reinforcing the other, or the billboard can drive you to the website and, and et cetera, et cetera. So um, 
galvanize uh, all channels, and then also to make sure you're instituting the tagging function in all that you're doing, especially on Instagram and Twitter. I always like to tag the world in all that I'm doing. So not only tag your local media outlets, but also shoot big, tag the New York Times, tag the Wall Street Journal, tag the Atlantic, tag, you know, whatever the case may be, because you'd be surprised who will pay attention to that um, IG post, to that tweet, um, and then you might get a call for a follow-up piece. So not only tag your local folks, on Twitter you get 10, so what I typically do is divide my 10 into local and national tags, but then on Instagram you get 20 tags. So you can go to town on Instagram <laughs> and have a really good time and, and diversify your reach, and um, you'd be surprised what kind of results you get. Love it, Chris. Yeah, um, it, you know, uh, I have to rely on our social media folks because I can't keep up. <laughs> I don't, Twitter, TikTok and everything else. So I, I kind of uh, re rely on those experts in terms of asking them, what else do I need to be doing? So. Um, I think uh, it's important because I do tend to focus a bit more on the more traditional press, but then leverage my experts, so to speak, to get them out, a message out bro more broadly. You know, one, uh, and I did mention the survey, and I would encourage people to look at doing that. And if anybody wants to maybe look at our survey questions, I'm more than happy to send those over because it is not a, um, it's not a difficult task to do. And I think it, it has been so impactful for us. And um, I think in terms of defining the impact on your community, that's, that's an important thing. Um, you know, another method, um, and, and we're having to look at this because, and I think we're all having to look at this, but we've actually had meetings on this in Dallas. We've been so concerned about the shrinkage in arts coverage. Um, we actually had a good outlet, Theater Jones, which focused very much on that. And they've just been devastated by the pandemic as well and are, you know, barely on life support and, um, you know, good folks there, but they're, they're struggling too. And our arts reports down. So we are having to start really looking at what else can we do to help create and generate news, not just news about our shows or news about our issues, but also criticism, right? Because so many of us need good arts criticism. Um, no great art city is without arts critics. Um, and so those are some challenges that we have. Um, so we're kind of looking, are there things that we can develop ourselves? You know, one area I think is a good area that people have probably not done is creating podcasts where you end up fostering a discussion over issues, over different things um, that are important to our community. And again, those are things that we can help push out. And so I think we need to start thinking of all those different ideas that are out there and things that are being used and how can we start utilizing those ourselves? And I think the podcasts are one that I think are fun um, because you can engage in discussion and um, guide the discussion. And uh, so I think we need to look at all of those different things that are out there. But again, I'd go back and, you know, if you're not particularly great at something, ask people for help um, within your organization, because I can guarantee you probably got good social media people. They're young, they have a different perspective, and uh, they're probably going to uh, bring a lot to the table for you. And I'd like to make a plug then, since Chris just talked about podcasts, you know, I created one for our film festival called Real Values, Real News, and it's R-E-E-L, because, you know, in Waco, there's not a lot of media coverage at all, or Central Texas. So I definitely invite, you know, any of you who are interested in being on, on my podcast, we cover the performing arts at length, please, you know, send me an email, would love, love, love to have you. But that's sometimes what you have to do in areas where, um, um, media um, coverage or criticism is lacking, you have to create it yourself. Yeah. And that's such a good point because I do think there's an opportunity to be seized here in that, you know, there's a bit of a dearth of good news and exciting events right now. So the arts is perfectly poised. I know, you know, we regularly get phone calls from our local newspaper and TV and radio journalists because there's not a whole lot going on and they're looking for content. And this is the ideal opportunity to tell the story of your organization, tell the story of the arts. Okay, I have another question um, come in here. Um, 
what do you think is the thing that the arts sector does worst when it comes to communication? What do we not get right? What are the things that we should be doing better? Um, I think uh, when it comes to shows, I think we're good because the shows have a kind of a set deadline. So when we're promoting shows or exhibitions or programs, it, it's kind of done and we move on to the next one. And unfortunately, when you're dealing with issues and you're dealing with broader things that aren't necessarily tied to a show, we have a very short attention span. We're all overworked. All, all of our organizations are proper, probably operating with less people. So we tend to lose focus and forget we have to have the follow through. We need to make sure we're connecting with our lawmakers, with our patrons, with these stories, but make sure we continue the stories. Um, it's something we've done with the survey, at least. We've been able to kind of keep the story alive by continuing to update the survey. That's one area I think we tend to drop the ball because we just, you know, we just have so much going on. It is so hard to do that. So I think that one way to deal with that is when you all sit down, uh, you know, and again, I've talked about how we do this as a community, but we sit down and develop a strategy. It's got a timeline. It's got who's going to do this, who's got that, so that we can stay on track. It's a checklist, so to speak, with a you know timing and reminders and stuff. So I, I think though that's the hardest thing is just to sustain the focus and um, and taking that over, sustaining those relationships we talked about. Right, At, you know the lawmakers. It's like sessions over. Oh, we're done. We'll get back to them in a bit and then we forget and all of a sudden it's the next session and we haven't seen them for two years. Okay, so that's another area. So I think, you know, those are both kind of tied together. I would just add to that um, one observation that I've seen arts organizations uh, make as it relates to communications is just the lack of innovation. Um, you know, Peter Drucker, I'm a, I'm a product of Peter Drucker School of Management, and he always talks about the best way to be in business is to innovate, innovate, innovate. And I would also add with the backdrop of COVID, not only do you need to innovate, but you need to be able to pivot, right? And so I've seen, at least in Waco, numerous arts organizations get stuck, they're frozen, and that limits the, the, the new ideas and the generation of new ideas. And therefore, um, you become silent because you're not talking about anything new. You have not pivoted in a way that is generating new ideas um, to, to talk to media people about. They want to know what's hot, what's going on, what you're what you're doing. And if you're if you're not innovating, if you're not pivoting quickly, then you're not generating any type of stories or um, or yeah, stories to talk to the media about. And that's how you continue to stay out there. You know, in the media sphere, you gotta keep innovating, pivoting, and generating those stories um, to the media. 100%, and we, our sector more than any should be good at that, right? Um, we in the arts, it's our bread and butter is being innovative and creative and yes, yeah, so you, and, and shaking things up, knowing how to how and when to shake them up is just a fan, fantastic superpower of our sector. Um, I We are almost out of time, but I would love to hear from um, both of you. What is the real win that you have had in like communicating to the um, to the media in a in an innovative, non-traditional way that has like has been a really great uh, win for you or your organization? Um, wow. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, I, I tend to look again on the, on the community. And I think for us, it's just, it's, um, the relationships that we have built, um, in terms of, uh, with our city council and with our, um, you know, and with our press to a degree. I mean, you know, we've we've done a good job of that. And I think, again, it's, it's work to sustain and it has paid off and I'll, I'll give a quick example. Um, you know, we've all had challenges with our city budgets, right? Um, and everybody's taken a hit. And, we, you know, we knew we were gonna take a hit and, but we worked very hard with our lawmakers to make sure, hey, don't, don't saddle us 
you know, we'll take our share, but make sure it's proportionate to what everybody else at the city is taking. Um, but because we had built these good relationships, at the last minute, some money came available. And some of those council members picked up the phone and said, we think there's some extra money available. We want to use at least some of it on the arts. How can we do that to help? And we were actually ready and turned around and said, this is the amount we need. And they were able, with that amount of money, to take most of the arts groups that they support in the city and get them back to the level of the previous year. Okay, so most of our arts groups received no funding cuts from one year to the next. And that didn't just happen, that happened because we had authentic relationships that we had built and developed over time. So when that happened, they picked up the phone and said, we think you guys could use a little of this. And again, they knew about the impact, all of that. So to me, I think because of those relationships, that paid off for us. I'm not sure if I answered your question, Fiona, but I think that was that was something I think that because of our approach, that was a payoff for us. That definitely counts as a big win. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say for me, you know, one of our biggest wins uh, most recently with the Waco Family and Faith International Film Festival has been um, our way to keep the film festival alive throughout the year. Um, it happens every February. However, during uh, the beginning of summer, we start our, 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 our new season, if you will, with community efforts. And last year, because of COVID, we, and because of you know my strong roots in the arts, I wanted to use the arts to, to keep us alive, so to speak. And so maybe many of you remember that last year, a lot of different towns and cities were uh, organizing virtual choirs and singing the blessing song, you know, to bless their various cities or states or whatever the case may be. So we did that in Waco, you know, galvanizing my strong music background and the, the musicians, the talented musicians I know here in Waco, as well as vocalists, you know, we, created a virtual choir as our way to give back to the city of Waco and show our blessing of, you know, for the city, but also start promoting the film festival, the 2021 film festival that is. And so that philanthropic, altruistic type of effort, the media loved, you know, we got covered on television and radio and print and online and by influencers. And we started, you know, digital word of mouth and all kinds of word of mouth, like, oh my gosh, the film festival is coming back. Submissions open in April and think, or excuse me, August. And, you know, it started that groundswell of just talking about uh, the 2021 film festival, you know, last July. And so being able to do um, unusual and innovative uh, activities just to keep, keep your communities talking and thinking outside the box, you know, now that we're in full blown promotion of the film festival, you know, I do and appear on the top country station twice a week. I started it last week, we did it last year. And, you know, I'm a African American woman, you know, appearing on the country station with Billy Bob and Michael, Michael Crow and all, but I can yeehaw and say y'all with the best of them. And that's what we have to do as arts organizations when I say innovate and get outside your box um, it's okay <laughs> for you to go and appear on the Latin uh, Latinx station or the African-American station you know as a Caucasian person whatever the case may be the arts are for everyone and we really have to make sure that we are doing our part from a communications uh, perspective to to reach all media, to meet all of our media folks so we're reach, really reaching everyone I love that getting outside our comfort zone and what I'm hearing over and over again in different ways is you need to make and sustain relationships even you know right the way through no matter what there's a really good question here um, from someone who's representing a small grassroots collective of artists advocating for more responsive and robust public support for our com creative community. And um, th they say, we don't have the power pool or capacity of a large organization like the AT&T Center. What advice do you have for an organization like ours when it comes to getting the attention of elected officials and media? And, you know, I, uh, with that, I would throw in, you know, how, 
what is the biggest bang for your, not necessarily bark, but time? If you have limited time, limited resources as a small organization, where would you recommend putting it in order to grab media and elected official attention? I mean, for me, I would definitely say galvanize some interns. You know, I have, since I teach seniors at Baylor University, I definitely have some of my marketing major seniors uh, working for the film festival this year, but definitely galvanize those 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 students around you, and you'd be surprised how um, outstanding even high school students are that can help support your digital efforts. You know, Chris uh, said this earlier. If you don't know it. Find that young person because they are amazing on TikTok and Twitch. If you haven't heard of Twitch, you need to check it out. Um, yeah, I can't but, keep up. <laughs> <laughs> but you'd be surprised, you know, even, you know, for me in Waco, there are um, some folks that you can, can galvanize and, and, and help you. I think um, it, it's twofold, right? I think uh, number one, it goes back to building those relationships and doing it, you know, with elected officials, you know, you start again when they're candidates. Okay. Yeah. Some of them, it's not going to pay off for you, but some of them it will. So you get them on board early on and make sure they know all the stuff. Same thing with the press, get them off deadline, fill them in, make them your ad, you know, make sure they understand all this and build those relationships because then when you do have something, you can call and say, hey, you know, I got this story. Do you want to do, you know, you've already established a relationship now. So it, you're opening the door uh, to that. Now on deadline and things that are more urgent, that's where I think you've got to, you've got to pull your other arts organizations in and start speaking as a community because you have more power than just one organization. You have the power of all those organizations speaking with one voice. You're gonna have more of an impact. You're gonna get more attention. Um, you know, we've had a few issues, um, whether it's Save Our Stages or the bathroom bill, where we have been able very quickly to literally rally and get 75 to 100 signatures of arts organizations on a letter that we send to the lawmakers, but we also send to the press. Okay, so it's again, if it was just the AT&T Performing Arts Center saying, you know, we oppose this or we support this, yeah. But all of a sudden, we've got our whole community working together and signing on to something. And you've got to work quick. You've got to have relationships within your arts community. But to me, you're adding a lot of, um, you know. Uh, the sum of the part, some, but some of the uh, some of the whole is greater than. Well, you know what I'm talking about, but um, but again, it's it's working together, and I think you end up uh, amplifying your impact. Well, that is a fantastic point at which um, to wrap. I hate to wrap this conversation because I know it could go on and on. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to Chris Heinbar and Dr. Tyra Lindsay Warren really fantastic, useful, implementable advice and inspiration there. I don't know about you guys, but I, I really feel inspired from having heard from both of you. Thank you so much. I'm gonna hand back to Anne to, uh, to bring, this, uh, bring this home for this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. That's, you. This is a really hard act to follow. Um, so impressed with the amount of information you gave and shared with us. And I'm really pleased that uh, we recorded this so that people can go back and slowly listen to all of the information that you imparted because there's just so much material that you shared. So, so, so thank you. Um, there's a few questions and answers, or a few questions that we have answered in the Q&A box and there's others that we haven't had a chance yet. Um, I know that Chris and I, Chris Kiley and I, our associate director who is uh, picture is not visible, but he's with us. Um, he and I are actually going to stay on this webinar for about another 30 minutes, just answering questions about next steps, etc. Um, but I, I want to at first and not obligate our, our members or our presenters unless they are so inclined to hang out with us. Just wanted to do a couple super quick things. Um, one, uh, one of the key questions was, will we share the top 10 tips? Um, that Shannon Gangerty has gone, gone over and absolutely we will be writing those up. In fact, following exactly what Dr. Tyra said is that we're gonna have an intern. We're gonna be asking an intern to listen through that and encapsulate that. And again, our four interns have been stellar on this. So I totally reiterate Dr. Tyra's recommendation for that. 
Um, we've had requests for any albums that Dr. Tyra has cut so that we, if there's any tips, um, please put them in the uh, chat box so people can hear your amazing jazz voice. We would love that. Um, what else, Chris? There was uh, Chris Heinbaugh. There was multiple requests for the survey questions that you shared that you discussed in the survey. So um, right. we, in looking at over these great questions, and some of them are comments. We really appreciate that. We will save these and share these with all of you attendees. If we weren't able to answer them yet, Chris and I can try to answer most of them on the way out. And some of these questions, believe me, are not one minute questions. These are deep discussions that would be really interesting to discuss on uh, another occasion. So thank, thank you all of these. Um, next, literal next steps. Oh, let me just actually go back to one of the very first questions that we ha hadn't answered. Um, and that was regarding Chris Heinbaugh's question about walking into a legislator's office and there was no art on, there was nothing on the wall, right? It was a bare wall and there was an opportunity. Um, I saw that in one of our legislative offices last session. Of course, we were in the Capitol, which is very different right now. And it was a new Dallas um, representative. And we went to Booker T. Washington and uh, high school and got a series of visual artworks. And we literally had an intern drive them down to the Capitol. And for the entire session, her walls were filled with student artworks from Booker T. Washington. Um, so a great plug, um, as Chris said, if you have legislation, again, we're not in person, so it's a little different. So maybe think about this to next session and or find out if they are having meetings in their capital offices or in their district offices is make sure they've got artwork from students who are in their districts. That is just so powerful. Um, and there's all there's another little hidden opportunity that you may not know about. And if the session does a Christmas tree, which they historically do, Every delegate has a Christmas ornament, which they are requested to make look like something in their district. And we worked with my representative, Gina Hinojosa, um, in her first term and got kindergarten students to talk about wishes for the year. And we put them inside this globe. And then um, there were seeds for planting blue bonnets. I mean, it was just this very creative. So it's a funny little trick of the trade is if you reach out to your legislator and find out if they need an artist to get involved in helping make their Christmas ornament for 2021. That's a great way to end the year. Just a funny little thing. Somebody had asked if they could actually bring some of their artwork into a meeting. Um, I would suggest establishing the relationship or you, know, you can always bring something in. There are limits in terms of gifts. Uh, I believe in the state of Texas, you can't give a gift to a legislator over $50. You can invite them to a performance as a board member or as a guest, but you can't give them a, something of monetary value over 50. Um, but if you have artwork and you, it's something that you would like to share and have hang in their office, you need to sort of establish that relationship first rather than just walk up and, and plant something in their office. So good question. And they may love to have original artwork. Um, and there was another office that Shannon and I went into a committee chair, a very important committee chair, and um, who, you know, we didn't know what his arts background was. And we walked into his office and he had these amazingly beautiful, stunning uh, abstract paintings. And we asked who had done them. It was the senator. The senator was an artist and these were all of his framed works. So this kind of information about doing your homework, understanding the connection of your elected officials, uh, contact with the arts is really important and um, can really cut and, and, their, and their staff um, and their staff. So um, really important in terms of building, building those relationships. So it's 1036. This has been awesome. Thank you. Next steps is after we log off today, but again, Chris and I will hang on till 11. If anybody has any further questions, we will save and, and share these questions. You'll be getting an email tomorrow. Everybody will be getting an email. It's going to be district specific. So you will see your Senate and your house district, who else has signed up. It may be one person, it may be 10 people. Um, the captain will be taking steps to set up the office and communicate with you. Um, if there is not a captain there, we need somebody to step up to the plate. And again, you can reach out to us if you need additional assistance, we will have our office hours. And we will send this all out to all of you attendees through our Eventbrite. So everybody, um, everybody who's registered on Eventbrite will get this information in an email um, tomorrow. And Boy, without further ado, Cookie, do you have any closing remarks you would like to share? Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Yeah, I just want to join in in thanking each of you for taking time. We still have a, a really good group that's hung in with us. 
Um, and we are so excited to have you here and participating. We look forward to the two weeks ahead. Um, those of you that have questions, please do hang on. It is important if you have raised a question that, that perhaps you have a chance to, to uh, get a little bit more information. So thank you again. We look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.